Right, Father Mike, come on out. Okay. Um, howdy, y'all. So, oh my gosh. Okay, we did it, we did it. Um, so uh, backstage, they're like, do you, know what, do you know what Howdy does to a crowd like this? I'm like, I think I know. <laughs> and now I, I know the decibels, and it's insane. Um, so a couple things as we get started. Uh, first, shoot, first, um, thank you. Like just, thank you for being here. Uh, one of the things I, you're welcome. <laughs> Um, one of the things that uh, I was just in getting ready for tonight, one of the things that kept coming back to me is just like that sense of, even at Mass tonight, as people were coming up for Holy Communion, I was just so struck by this truth and yet struck by the sadness of wondering. The truth was, as everyone kept coming forward, I was just like, I don't know if this person knows how much they matter. Like, I don't know if this person, the next person, I don't know if they know how much they matter. And again, that sense of like, oh, this person matters, this person matters. And it just, it was one of those situations where I was just like, I just, the sadness of like, I don't know if they know how much they matter. And so as we start tonight, I just want to let you know, you matter. Um, and you're supposed to be here. And also just one thing I think is so important is maybe needs to be said is I am so grateful. I know that everyone who's in this room right now, you have a thousand other places you could be. You have a thousand other things you could be doing right now. Don't think about those things. But I know that you, you have a, a bunch of other places you could be. And so please, alone with that, I don't take this for granted at all, this opportunity to be with you tonight. Um, yes, thank you. That was the first thing. Second thing is, it's called Magnify. And I was just like, oh my gosh, that, I bet that comes from Luke's Gospel. And Luke's Gospel, if you remember, at the very beginning when um, Mary is, conceives... Jesus, and uh, wasn't her doing, it was the Holy Spirit, just FYI, spoiler, and, um, and she goes to Elizabeth, and Elizabeth says, who am I that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And Mary says this, she says, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, my soul magnifies the Lord, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. And there's something about tonight, you know, in a, th there's a talk, right, obviously that's this, um, but after that, it, what Father Will said is their adoration, and one of the things about adoration is we just get to praise God. One thing about adoration that sometimes can happen is we get really caught up in like, how am I doing? Like, how am I doing? It's called navel gazing. Um, it's one of those like, how am I doing? How am I doing? How am I doing? Like, no, no, no. It's called adoration because we're looking at him and we're adoring him. We're giving him worship. We're saying my soul magnifies God. And so tonight, if you remember nothing else, if you do nothing else, um, when it comes time for adoration, just to be able to say, Lord, I actually magnify you. I want to worship you. I want to adore you. Amen? Okay, the next thing is, speaking of Luke's gospel, I was, I kept reading it, and I was like, Luke's, he keeps getting better and better. In Luke chapter 5, there's a story I want to talk about tonight. Luke chapter 5, and uh, it's a story you maybe have all heard, but I want to kind of walk through it with y'all, y'all. Is that all right? I'll say. Okay, so, so one of the things, again, I get to, you guys, I get to use the vosotros form of English when I'm down here. I mentioned, I mentioned this last night for, for the guys. I was like, you guys, I get to, I get to say y'all, and you don't look, when I say y'all in Minnesota, they're all like, <laughs> that's a, that's, they, they think it's cute. And I'm like, no, it's actually a thing. Some parts of the world, they say this. <laughs> so, uh, also, I, I discovered this last night uh, with, the, with the men. I, I, I didn't, I mean, I, I heard of booing and hissing. But I was like, bunch of Slytherins around here. I don't understand. I just like, okay, I have to get used to this. And also, my gosh, okay, we haven't started yet. We're gonna get started in a second. But also, like, you get feedback quite quickly. Like, like if there's something like that, you're like, yeah, yeehaw and stuff. Wait, wait, I'm sorry. I don't know if you guys, I don't know if you actually say that, so I apologize. Stereotypes, <laughs> am I right? Yeah, you're going to hiss at that. And that's the, uh-huh. <laughs> Don't know what to say next. Okay. There's going to be heckling. It's going to be fun. Okay, Luke chapter 5. Thank you for reminding me. 
There's this story, and it says, I will not paraphrase, I will read the holy word of God. <laughs> so this one thing happened, and Jesus was like, by the shore. No, Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. If you have a Bible, you can read it. If you don't, listen. Actually, you know what? Sometimes you can just listen to the Bible. It's a thing, it's a thing people do. It's the thing some people like to do. So, okay, okay. Now we're getting serious. No more jokes. It's time for Jesus. So no more jokes. Woo! I don't remember. I'm getting woos, I'm getting hisses. I don't know what to think anymore. While the crowd was pressing in on Jesus and listening to the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret. That's also the Sea of Galilee. Why do they call it two things? I don't know. He saw two boats there alongside the lake. The fishermen had disembarked. They were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, he asked him to put out a short distance from shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. After he finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. Simon said in reply, Master, we've worked hard all night and have caught nothing, but at your command, I will lower the nets. When they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their nets were tearing. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come to help them. They came and filled both boats so that they were in danger of sinking. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at the knees of Jesus, and he said, Depart from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For astonishment at the catch of fish they had made seized him and all those with him, and likewise James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching men. When they brought their boats to the shore, they left everything and followed him. The Gospel of the Lord. You, Lord awesome. So, um, very liturgical. Well done. This story, this story is what we're going to talk about tonight. Because I think this story talks to every one of us. I don't know where you're coming from. I don't know um, what your background when it comes to Jesus is, what your background when it comes to being a disciple of Jesus. But here's the thing I love about Jesus. Oh my gosh, one of the many things. Um, here is Jesus. He's teaching the crowds. And what happens? They, they all can't, they're pressing in on him, so he needs to get some distance. And I love this. He just, he just gets into the boat on the shore as guys were cleaning their nets. Here's us. And Jesus is, Jesus, now we know Jesus is the end game. Jesus' the end game is he's not going to stop until he, gets, until he gets everything from Simon. He's not going to stop until he has Simon's whole heart, until he has Simon's whole life. But what is his first move? Jesus is so patient. Jesus is so patient. He just simply hears Simon cleaning his nets, and Jesus says, hey, can I get in your boat? And you don't have to do anything else. You don't have to do anything different. Don't, don't stop what you're doing. Just can I get in your boat? Now, this is some people tonight. This is just a snapshot of your life on Thursday in October, right now. Jesus is just saying, he's patient. He's so patient. And he's just saying, can I be in your boat? You don't have to change a thing. Don't stop what you're doing. But can I get closer to you than I am right now? And I love this because I imagine Simon's like, sure. <laughs> it's going to be over here cleaning my nets. I'm not sure if you really like the smell of fish. Actually, you don't mind because there's no fish here. <laughs> so it doesn't matter because I'm a failure. More on that later. <laughs> but this first step of Jesus being so patient because he just says, and this is for many of us right now, tonight, if Jesus might just be saying, can I get in your boat? You don't have to change a thing. Don't stop what you're doing. But here's the thing about Jesus. He's not just patient. He's also kind of pushy. This is the theme of tonight. Jesus is patient and pushy. Because the next thing, he gets done with his talk. And then he, what's he say? He says, hey, uh, go out into the deep water. So the first step is get into the boat. Don't have to change a thing. Don't stop anything. Just keep doing what you're doing. But then he's like, okay, let's, how about a little more? Go out into the deep water and lower your nets for a catch. You know, this is an interesting thing because simultaneously, the patient part of Jesus here is him saying, hey, listen, I'm not asking you to do anything you don't already know how to do. Just, just go out into the deep water and lower your nets right at you. You did that all night last night. I'm not asking you to do anything that you don't already know how to do. And this is one of the things for your life. You might be the place where Jesus is just saying, hey, can I get into your boat? Don't stop what you're doing. No worries. I'm, I just want to be part of your life. The next step is, okay, the thing you know how to do already, can you do it 
Do it just the same with one difference. This might be you tonight. Do what you know how to do with one difference. And what's that difference? Take me with. That's, that's all. So here is Jesus asking Simon to do exactly what Simon knows how to do with only one difference. Just simply do that with me. Now, this is, this is one of the things I think sometimes as, as Christians, sometimes as Catholics, we, we, don't, we don't think that's enough. Because it's one of those th- situations where it's like, well, no, I mean, if I'm going to do something uh, for Jesus, I'm going to be a Christian. If I'm going to actually be a hardcore Catholic, then I have to be a priest, okay. Or I have to be a religious sister. Or I have to, like, be a professional Christian. I have to be a professional Catholic. I have to be someone who, like, the church pays by salary. That's sometimes what we think is, like, the requirement. And that's not the requirement. Why? Because Jesus simply says to Simon, do what you know how to do with one difference. Take me with you. One of, one of my favorite images for being a disciple is what Simon's life was like after this. Because what was Simon's life after, life after this? When he left, leave everything and follows after Jesus? Every morning, what would he do? Every morning he would get up and look across the, the burnt embers of the, that night's fire, look across the fire, and just look and see Jesus there. And basically say, Jesus, what are we going to do today? That's it. A snapshot of a disciple is when you get up out of bed, okay, Jesus, what are we going to do today? Jesus, in wanting to call Simon as his disciple, simply says, the next step, just let me in your boat, you don't have to change a thing. The next step is this, okay, do what you know how to do, but do it with me there. How differently would your life and my life look if we actually just, that's what we did? Okay, we have class tomorrow, unless you're one of those lucky people who don't have class on Fridays. But... Yes. <laughs> Just kidding, I didn't S you. Um, but what would tomorrow look like if the first thing you do when you woke up, your eyes open, and you just said, Jesus, you're here, you're present, I know you love me, I know you're in my boat already. What do you want to do today? Come with me. Because Jesus, I have to tell you this, I'm guessing that tomorrow, He's not asking you to leave everything and go follow him. My guess is tomorrow, he's going to say, go to class. <laughs> but that's what he's going to say. For most of your life, for most of our lives, what he's going to say is, okay, get up and go to work and bring me with you. Just, just change one thing, and that one thing is, I'm there too. What we do typically is we, like, we sometimes treat Jesus like, uh, like a good pet. And so we love the pet when he's, when he's like, when, when the pet's in the right place, when the pet's at home and pet's in this pet's corner or whatever, the pet stays, you know, kind of like, oh, I love you, this whole kind of thing where we just like get up with the pet, like, I love my pet. And on our phone, there's a picture of our pet and then scroll through with another picture of our pet and it's super cute. And on Instagram, there's all the pictures of our pet. We love our pet in its proper place. But then when we have to go out, we're like, stay. Stay. No, be a good boy. Stay. And that's what we, how many times that's how we start our day with Jesus. Even if you're someone who start your day with prayer. Start, maybe even go to the chapel. Maybe even go to St. Mary's and you're like, I have a holy hour. Maybe you start with mass or something. You, you're mass at the crack of noon. Um, and, and, and then, but then after prayer, it's like one of these like, okay, stay Jesus. Stay, stay Jesus. No, no, Jesus. Stay, stay, stay. And I love Jesus. He's on my phone. He's my wallpaper. Like I, I love the Lord. But I don't take him with me. And I love Jesus as long as he stays in his spot. Here's what Jesus is doing with Peter. He is so patient. Peter's one step, but he's also so pushy. Peter, take me with you. Go do what you need. Go do what you know you already know how to do. But take me with you. Let me come along. Our temptation, once again, is, well, you, don't, you wouldn't like it there. <laughs> I would take you with me, but like you, you wouldn't want to hear what we're going to talk about. You wouldn't want to see what I'm going to do. You wouldn't want to, you wouldn't want to be there. Even if it's not like awful, even if you're not like, you know, planning on sinning or something, it's one of those situations like people plan on sinning. Yes, they do. But it's one of those situations where it's just like, God, there's no room for you. Some of us tonight, I'm afraid we've crafted a life where that's what we could say. 
Jesus says, hey, go and do what you already know how to do. And we might say, I, I'd like to, but Jesus, there's just no room for you. Or we could say, here's an, here's an excuse. What does Simon Peter say? Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. We work hard all night and caught nothing. I think sometimes, I think sometimes our excuse or our reason to not take Jesus with us is because, like, well, I failed. I've worked hard all night and I've caught nothing. And Jesus says, well, hey, put your, go out in deep water, lower your nets for a catch. Like, yeah, you don't know how bad of a fisherman I am. <laughs> I think a lot of us, we believe that we're disqualified. Tonight is, 13 years ago tonight, Just before I came on stage, I sent a text to this man because tonight is the 13th year anniversary of his sobriety. And I remember getting a call yesterday, 13 years ago, saying that this man that is incredibly important to me, that has been one of the most influential men in my entire life, but who had developed a an addiction that is like, no, we, he's got to stop. He, he had hurt himself. We had seen it happening for years. We tried confronting him for years. His wife had just almost given up. His kids had gotten to the point where it was like, okay, if you keep doing this, you don't get to see your grandkids anymore. But he was deep, deep, deep in denial. We'd say, you just had a drink. I did not. I saw you with my own eyes. No, nope, you're seeing things. I talked to the, talk to the bar bartender. Nick, did you just serve him? Yeah, you guys are full of it. So we got this call and said, hey, you need to, need to drive. We're going to have a conversation. We're going to have an intervention. I remember we were all gathered around in the kitchen, and he walked in the house. He saw all of us and was like, he's like, hey, Something's up. I'll be right back. And he left the room. And he came back. I remember this so clearly because he said, before you say anything, I'd like to make a statement. <laughs> I'm like, what is this, a press conference? <laughs> I mean, I'm not experts with interventions, but I don't think that they have this. He's like, before you say anything, I'd like to make a statement. But he said, I know. I know, and I hate myself. This is a man who has literally saved hundreds of lives. Here's a man who has given so much of his life for other people. Here's a man who has raised a family that's just so incredibly blessed. A man who's, who's crafted an entire life over the course of his entire life that just has touched and blessed and affected and gifted so many people. But then this thing happened. That then this addiction grabbed onto him. And his first words, at the beginning of the end, at the beginning of freedom, I know what you're gonna say, and I hate myself. Because there's something about when we know ourselves, there's something about this when we know our brokenness. There's something about this when we know, like, no, I know where I've been. I know what I've done. I've failed. And I'm disqualified. You know, the story gets, gets deeper, gets worse. Because in this moment, what happens? So he says, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing, but at your word... I'll lower our nets. What happens? They catch a bunch of fish. You just heard the story. They catch a bunch of fish. And what does Simon Peter say? Seeing this, 
seeing this, he falls at the knees of Jesus, falls at the feet of Jesus, and he says, depart from me, Lord, for I'm a sinful man. See, this is one of the things that happens to a lot of us. When we actually encounter the real Jesus, not like the, to the, our, our version of Jesus, the, the actual Lord and Savior of, of the humanity, the one who created all the world, the, the one through whom everything was made, the God who actually knows your name and loves you, when we actually meet him, not a fake version, not a twisted version, not a, not a child's version of Jesus, but you actually meet Jesus. We also see the truth about our own hearts. And the big temptation when we see the truth about our own hearts is we're like, I don't belong here. Where Simon looks at Jesus and he says, you have to leave. You have to leave. I don't know if you've ever felt like that in front of God. If you haven't, I don't know if you've actually ever met him. Maybe you have. Maybe this is just me. But when we encounter the real God, there is this sense, and we experience like the truth of that is him. And we see the truth that's actually in our own hearts. So often, our response is, you have to go. I mean, this is what happens right in the beginning of the a whole story. You have Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2, where God makes this world, makes it so good, because God is good. He makes this world good. He makes Adam and Eve good. And he's, he makes them for friendship with him. And then what happens? The serpent comes, chapter 3 happens. It's stupid. It's the worst thing ever. And, and the serpent comes into the garden, and they fall. Immediately, their eyes are opened. They realize they're naked. They sowed fig leaves. And then they hear God coming. And what happens when they hear God coming? They hide themselves. And this becomes the pattern for every single one of us. In fact, you know, the catechism, which is coming out next year, I came out in 1991, but like the audio version, um, the catechism says that from that first sin, trust died in man's heart. From that very first sin, trust died in man's heart. So they hear God coming, the God who is their friend, the God who is their father, the God who's given them everything they possibly could want, and what do they do? They hide. This is what sin makes us want to do. This is what like, our failures make us want to do. Our, our sins and our failures make us want to hide from the Lord. And I just love this because this next section here in Genesis chapter 3 is so powerful. I don't, know, I don't know if you feel like hiding tonight. Maybe you can feel like hiding in front of Jesus in the Eucharist. I remember there was a man in seminary with me. Um, he wasn't raised Christian, wasn't raised Catholic. And at one point he had a friend who brought him to adoration. And this friend didn't tell him what adoration was. Like, you know, Father Will told him, adoration is Jesus truly present because Jesus said, I'm truly present. Um, but this friend was like, oh, just come and pray with me. And so Dennis, this is his name, Dennis went into prayer and he sat in the very back and he looked up at the monstrance and he said, I just sat there and, I, and actually I hid behind the pew and I just sobbed. And I didn't know what I was looking at. I just knew that it was holy and I wasn't. I just knew that it was, I was looking at good and I knew I wasn't. And I just hid there behind the pew in front of me and just couldn't stop crying. Because who am I to look at holiness? Who am I to look upon goodness himself? And he didn't even know the truth of Jesus. He just knew that's more than me. Sin makes us want to hide. When we fail and we feel disqualified. So then what happens? This is Genesis 3 again. We went from Luke 5 to Genesis 3. So, God, I love this. It says, uh, the man and his wife hid themselves in the garden. The Lord God then called to the man and asked him, where are you? Now, it's very clear. The Bible makes it very clear. Catechism makes it very clear. Church makes it very clear. God doesn't ask, where are you? Because he doesn't know where Adam and Eve are. Like, what the? They were just, they were just here. I, he, <laughs> but picture that though. It's kind of funny. What the? I just, you know, my car keys, where are they? He asks, where are you? Because he wants to give Adam and Eve a chance to reveal themselves. This is what God does for all of us. When we, when we feel broken, when we feel disqualified because of what we've done or because of what's happened to us. 
God doesn't just like, Poof, come out. He's like, he says, where are you? Because he wants to give us the chance to come to him. He's seeking us out. But he, remember, he's patient. And he says, where are you? And so the man answered, I heard you in the garden, but I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. And the God answers, who told you you were naked? Again, not because God doesn't know. In fact, this whole next section, here's what God says. Man says, I was naked and afraid before the TV show. <laughs> so I hid myself. God said, who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then from the tree of which I had forbidden you to eat. Those are the words that the Lord God said to the man. Who told you that you were naked? You have eaten then of the fruit of the tree that I have forbidden you to eat. Those are the words. How we hear those words will tell everything about how you see God. Like the tone in which we hear those words will reveal everything you need to know about your image of God. Because I think a lot of times when we hear these words are, who told you you were naked? You have eaten freaking of the fruit of the tree. He didn't say freaking of the fruit of the tree. I, I had told you not to eat. I think that's how most of us hear that. I'm so disappointed. I am just so angry. And that's how we see God. I'm disqualified. I, I don't belong here. Simon's saying, you, you have to leave me. I can't stand if you're present. Or maybe the way God said this is, who told you you were naked? You can just hear God's heart breaking in his voice. Like, who told you you were naked? You have eaten then of the fruit of the tree. I'd forbidden you to eat. And God's heart is breaking, not because he's so disappointed, not because he's, he's just so ticked off. His heart is breaking because he knows what has to come now. God's heart is breaking because he knows that it's gonna be a really long road for you. Because he knows that from now on, from now on, You've, made, you've, made, you've been made for love. Every single person here, you've been made for love. Like the source of your being is love himself. And the, the, the destiny of your being, like your, God made you to be with him forever in love. But here's the thing, and also to be with each other in love. But because of this, here's God's heart breaking because he's saying, okay, I know, I know what it's gonna cost you to love now. I know that from now on, love always involves sacrifice. I know this. That's why he says to the woman, from now on, um, you're going to bring forth life and you're going to love this new life with your whole heart, but it is going to hurt a lot. Not because God's like, it's going to hurt a lot, but because it's like, this is what happens, has to happen now because your hearts are selfish now. Our hearts are all selfish and our hearts are going to be saying, like, I don't want to do it if it's going to cost me something. I don't want to do it if it's going to be painful. And God says, no, you have to learn that love always involves sacrifice. So this new life that you create, you're going to love with everything you have, and it is going to hurt because you have to learn that love always involves sacrifice. And to the man, he says, from now on, you're going to have to get into your crappy car and uh, the crappy commute to your crappy job and sit in your crappy cubicle <laughs> and amid the thorns and thistles of the sweat of your brow, I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> but you're, that's how you're going to provide for your family because that's how you're going to provide for the people you love because you have to know this. You have to learn. From now on, love always involves sacrifice. I mean, even... <laughs> I don't know if you ever caught this in Genesis 3. In verse 21, it says, For the man and his wife, the Lord God made leather garments with which he clothed them. Two things here. They're left, they leave Eden. And so does God. They leave Eden and God goes with them. They leave paradise and God leaves paradise with them. 
God goes with them into the wilderness. God goes with them into danger. God goes with them into this world that is broken and this world that is difficult and this world that takes so much and this world that kills us. God goes with them. And what does he do? What does he make for them? For the man and his wife, the Lord God made leather garments with which he clothed them. What kind of garments? Leather garments. What has to happen in order to make leather garments? Something Something has has to die. Something has to die. Here's God saying, okay, again, love, from this moment on, love always involves sacrifice. Even for God himself to care for us, something has to die. Because now on, from now on, love always involves sacrifice. Obviously, as you know, how does he rescue us? We know this in the fullness of time. Here is God himself who comes to us, to meet us. And he doesn't just like wave his hand over us and say, you're all saved. He could have. Actually, God could have. You know, the God, the God in Genesis 1 who says that he breathed the stars. All of them. Hundreds of, hundred billions, hundred trillion. Well, however many stars there are, just, oh, there they are. <laughs> that God who made everything out of nothing Like, he could save us by just being like, saved. Boom. (laughs) He could just think saved and we'd be saved. How does God actually, so then he comes out to be one of us and he he heals people and that saves us. No. And he preaches and that saves us. No. And he walks among us and and delivers uh, people from demons. That saves us. No. How does he save us? He saves us by showing us that love always involves sacrifice. St. Paul writes to the Romans, he says, God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God, God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more now, now justified, now belonging to him, can we be made righteous? How much now? The Lord God who's adopted you as his daughters, adopted you as his sons in baptism, you belong to him. So when we have this, this line that come, here's Jesus comes into our boat, and what does he say? He says, he put out in, the, in deep water for, Lord, you're not for a catch. And like, I can't, Jesus, I failed. Do you realize? Do you realize that Jesus knew who Simon was before he got into the boat? You guys, that's like a big, like a mind blow thing kind of thing. It's like, that's a mind blowing thing. Jesus, yeah, thank you for that. That's one of those. Jesus knew who Simon was before he got into Simon's boat. When he says, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Jesus wasn't like, ah, my heavens, you are? <laughs> well, what kind of sins? Like, no. Jesus knew who Simon was when he got into Simon's boat. Jesus knew that Simon had failed when he got into Simon's boat. Here's the big thing. If Simon hadn't failed, Jesus couldn't have gotten into his boat. Why was Simon there in the first place? What was he doing? Cleaning his nets, not cleaning the fish. They caught no fish. If Simon had been successful, he wouldn't be there. If he had 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 the victory, he wouldn't be there. If Simon had done... (laughs) What he set out to do, if he had accomplished the goal he had had when he got up, got up that morning, went out that night fishing. But think about every hour that passed during the course of that night when Simon was bringing in the nets and nothing, and bringing in the nets and nothing. It was like, imagine, you know, we like the chosen because it's just like super awesome. Um, and, and it's one of those like Lexio Divina or like, you know, Ignatian prayers or like someone just had Ignatian prayer. Like, what would it be like? And they just made a movie about it. Um, but here's, Man, imagine every single hour going by, ticking away, and Simon once again tries, and he brings in this net, and it's empty again. You can imagine. Again, he has his wife back home, and it's just like, I'm not, I'm, I can't do it. I'm not providing. Why did I choose to do this? Why did I think I could do something like this? I'm just a failure. You realize that if he hadn't failed, Jesus could never have gotten into his boat. You know, as I said, God, he is love. And he made you from love, and he's made you for love. But you know what the, the most, you know, the, the scholars and like saints and stuff have said that 
The highest form of God's love is his mercy. Love is always, love always has to be freely given. But mercy is unique. There's a prerequisite for mercy. The prerequisite for mercy is you have to have failed first before you get it. That the God, the, the, one of the greatest gifts God could ever possibly give, the highest love God could ever possibly love us with, mercy, has a prerequisite. And that prerequisite is you failed. That prerequisite is <laughs> you've sinned. The prerequisite for mercy is you don't deserve it. Because mercy is the love of God that we need the most, that we deserve the least. The mercy of God is the love of God that we need the most, but we deserve the least. And the prerequisite for being loved like that is you have to have been a failure. You have to have failed. You have to have tried all night, worked hard all night, got nothing. If Simon Peter had been successful, he wouldn't have been there on the shore of the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus could never have gotten into his boat. So here's the question for all of us right now. Do I lament my brokenness? Do I just hate my weakness? Do I look in the mirror, as this man had told me, the, who was addicted to alcohol, and he said, I looked in the mirror every morning. I couldn't even look at myself in the mirror. I would look myself in the mirror and say, I hate you. Because I'm a failure. Failure is a prerequisite for the most powerful and most graceful form of God's love. So if you find yourself in this place, then you qualify because mercy is the love of God that we need the most but deserve the least. One thing I think is remarkable, go back to Simon Peter here, Luke chapter 5. Lower your nets for a catch, catch all this big, big number of, big mess of fish. And at this point, we realize that here's the stages of Jesus. Jesus is so patient, right? Let me get in your boat. Don't have to stop doing what you're doing. Put out a little bit from shore. Do what you know to do. And then he says this. He says, okay, from now on, you know, you know your limitations, but from now on, here's the thing. I don't know if you know this. I have a vision for your life. I don't know if you know this, but I have a vision for your life. Every single person in this room, God has a vision for your life. Every one of you, God has a vision for your life. And sometimes we think, again, like that sense of like, well, what is it? What, share it. Let me see if I like it. We'd be like, I don't know if I'll be ready for that kind of vision uh, that you might have for my life. Could you give me some options? I would like A, B, and C. And also tell me how it's going to work out as well. That would be really nice. And so A, give me a five-year, 10-year, 15-year plan. And if that's going to be perfect for me, or like maybe C, B. He doesn't. He just says, I have a plan. I have a vision for your life. From now on, you'll be fishing for men. From now on. This thing that you spent your whole life doing, it's going to actually help you in the future. This is the, I think it's pretty, you know, I don't know how to say, I don't want to insult the Lord, but I think Jesus is pretty clever. And uh, depart from me, Lord, I'm a sinful man. Don't be afraid, Jesus says. Don't be afraid. From now on, you'll be catching men. Two things. One is I'll be with you. Don't be afraid. Secondly, Everything that's come before this, everything that you've done up till now has prepared you for the next step. Everything that's come before you has prepared you for the next step. Because why? Because God has a vision for your life. And here we are sitting in this building and God has a vision for your life. Everything that's come before, God has a plan for this. God can use it. Now, it doesn't mean that everything that happened in your past is like the ideal thing or the thing God directly wanted, but he allowed it to happen because everything in your life has prepared you for the next step. What God wants for your life. And it's just one of those situations where, let's go back to the Old Testament again. In the Old Testament, there's uh, the first book of Samuel. And in, in 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel, there's this guy named David. 
And so King David is one of my favorite people I talk about because there's just so much about his life that just is so good to study. And in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, there's a story. And um, people of Israel are in battle with the people of Philistia, right? So the Philistines versus the Israelites. We know this story? And the Philistines, Philistines have this like big giant of a man named... Yes, because you guys are from the South and you're your Bible. Well done. So <laughs> there's a guy named Goliath and he's a giant. And what's, the, what's Goliath do? Goliath comes out and he says, listen, we don't have to like have whole armies fight each other and kill each other. How about you send out one person and I'll kill him and then we win. <laughs> if they kill me, no problem, you win. It's not going to happen, but it's fine. So here's what happens. Goliath, if you know the story, Goliath comes out day after day for weeks, maybe possibly for months, and he comes and issues this challenge. Fine, God bless you. Finally, there's this man. He's not a man, he's a boy. The boy is David, and David's brothers are on the battle lines. Now, this has gone on for weeks, and D David's father, Jesse, says, David, bring some bread to your brothers. So David says, okay, bring, my bread to my, bring some bread to my brothers. And then he brings some bread, just as Goliath comes out and starts challenging the people of Israel, and starts insulting the name of the Lord God. And here's where uh, this gets kind of fun. It says this, it says, um, David then said to the man standing by, what will, be do what will be done for this man who kills the Philistine and frees Israel from this disgrace? Who is this uncircumcised Philistine in any case that he should insult the armies of the living God? And they tell him, well, the person who does that and gets to marry the king's daughter and gets all these things, and he's like, Huh. <laughs> but then it goes in verse 28, verse chapter 17, it says, when Eliab, his oldest brother, heard him speaking with the men, when heard David, little brother, speaking with the men, he said, he grew angry with David, and he said, why'd you come down? With whom have you left those sheep in the desert meanwhile? I know your arrogance and your evil intent. You came down just to enjoy the battle. If any of us here are younger brothers, we know what this is like. Because David's next words, David's next words are, what have I done? I was only talking. <laughs> Younger brothers of the world, I mean, honestly, it's one of those that you just say something, just show up, and your older brother's like, you're a moron, you're stupid. I'm like, I just walked in the room. <laughs> what did I do wrong? And I always want to highlight that, just because it makes me feel a little better. I'm working through some stuff, you guys. Okay, so... <laughs> What did I do? Just talking. And then it goes on to say, yet he turned from one another and asked the same question. Everyone gave him the same answer. And the, word, the words that David had spoken were overheard and reported to Saul, the king. Some kid thinks he can take Goliath. So the king sends for David. And this is the next part. This is so awesome. Then David spoke to Saul. This is the kid, right? The young, the young the boy speaking to the king. Let not your majesty lose courage. I'm at your service. <laughs> this little 13-year-old, don't worry, King Saul. <laughs> or maybe more like this, don't worry, King Saul. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> I'm at your service to go and fight this Philistine. Imagine King Saul was like, oh, thank heavens. <laughs> okay, <Let's>, Finally. <laughs> But no, Saul answers David. He says, you can't go up and fight against the Philistine. For you're only a youth. He's been a warrior since his youth. You cannot, you couldn't possibly hope to win. You're just a kid. He's been a, war, a warrior since he was a kid. And then this is when David presents his resume. And his resume is so B.A. It is amazing. Because that's his degree. <laughs> Listen, at least no one hissed, so that's okay. I, I, I consider that a win in, with this crowd. So then, <laughs> can't do it now. Okay. So David gives his resume, and he says this. He, well, king, I used to tend my father's sheep. And whenever a lion or a bear came to carry off a sheep from the flock, I would go after it and attack it and rescue its prey from its mouth. If it attacked me... I would seize it by the jaw and strike it and kill it. And I've killed both a lion and a bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them because he dared to insult the armies of the living God. Yeah. See, I was right when I said BA, you guys. It wasn't just being extra. It was real. But I imagine this. This is, here, here, here's David saying like, yeah, that's my summer job. Uh, 
I fight bears and lions. <laughs> kind of like, imagine, again, I, I sometimes think like, okay, what would it be now, like, if someone came up now, the modern day David, King Saul, I can take him. Are you kidding? Yeah, like, I totally, like, crush it at Call of Duty. <laughs> no, seriously, I've killed so many Nazis, it's, like, amazing. It is, I made it all the way to the big boss at the end of, you know, Mortal Kombat, and it's like, I'm pretty good. I go left, right, up, down. You know, it's one of those. <laughs> but here's the thing. David's past prepared him for the future God had for him. David's past had prepared him. This man could go in, no, this boy could go into battle with this giant why? Because God can say, God says, I can use everything, everything. Simon Peter, you've been a fisherman your whole life. You know what it's like to toil. You know what it's like to be out in the middle of the night. You know what it's like to try and fail and try again. Peter, you know all of these things. And now what's going to happen is you're going to take all of that and you're going to use it to help people know about my grace and my love for them. Even your brokenness. See, because that's the thing, God can, God bless you, can even use even, you didn't hear that up there, but it was a really cute sneeze. <laughs> that kind of got my, it was like, it was one of those like, achoo. It was like, it was like a kind of a song, almost like, you know, like, almost like a question, achoo. I don't know. I would like to describe my mom's sneezes in a second. My mom sneezes from her toes. She like takes a running start where it's like this, this cry of like, it's coming. <laughs> that was not how my mom sneezes. That was a cute little sneeze. So God can even take our brokenness. I remember uh, when I was in seminary, I remember hearing, it was when I was in seminary, John Paul II was still the Pope. And <laughs> here we go. And I remember hearing about, um, there's a priest from America who uh, had gone to school in Rome. And he again, got ordained and he had come back. Years later, he came, had come back and he got, some, he got the chance. He was kind of in the bureaucracy. He got to meet the Pope right at one point. And uh, what happened was he had to get up really early because apparently if you ever meet the Holy Father, you have to get up really early and uh, get to the Vatican and this whole kind of thing. And as he was, he was going through the streets of Rome early, early in the morning, there was this homeless man who was outside one of the churches. And Keanu was going by because he's in a hurry. He's going to meet the Holy Father. But he looked down and he's like, wait a second, I think I, I, think I know that guy. He's like, I think I know this homeless man. And he stopped and he, he just, he said in Italian, you know, whatever they say, scusi, probably. Um, <laughs> and the homeless man looked up at him and recognized him too. They had been in seminary together. They'd actually been ordained together. Here's this homeless man who is actually a priest. And he, and he, and he said, like, wait a second, you know, how this happened to you? And then he, he kind of told him the story about how kind of early on in his priesthood, he, all, he had become addicted to, to drugs. And he said, I, and I, I threw everything away. I, I lost complete control. I made a shipwreck of my life. I destroyed everything, hurt everyone I loved everyone who trusted me, everyone who prayed for me, my whole vocation time, my whole seminary time, all these people. And he said, now I'm just, here I'm just a homeless piece of garbage. And the priest was, that was the not homeless, was like, I, are you gonna be here? Because like, I, I'm, he's like, I'm gonna, well, I'm gonna go meet the Pope. So, uh, no. but he said, no, I'm gonna go meet the Holy Father. But I, so I have to go right now. But like, are you gonna be here? Can I, can I find you again? Can we, can we talk? Can I help in any way? And he said, yeah, I don't have anywhere to go. I just, I, here's, this is my spot, you know, on, this, on these steps of this church. So he leaves and, and he goes uh, to meet the John Paul II. And in the midst of this, this conversation, he says at the end, he says, Holy Father, I just have to tell you one thing. Something crazy happened to me on the way here. And he described the scene. He said, this guy I was in seminary with who got ordained with me, and he's a homeless man here in Rome. And John Paul II stopped and he said, do you know, what, can you find him again? He said, yes, he told me where he'd be. He said, find him and bring him back here tomorrow morning. I want to talk to him. So 
the priest leaves and finds the homeless priest and, and he says, yeah, so I came back and uh, so I told John Paul about you <laughs> and he wants to talk to you. <laughs> Can you imagine? My bishop last week, earlier this week, in one of the meetings, he was like, uh, Father Mike, I'd like to talk to you after this meeting. And I was like, what did I do? What did I do? What did I do? Like, I can imagine the John Paul II being like, yeah, he wants to talk to you. I told him all about you, and he wants to have a little meeting. So he says, what do I do? He said, well, here I'm staying at this place. Come with me. You can get cleaned up and sleep in a bed tonight, and, and we'll go tomorrow. So they do this, and next morning, they go to the Vatican, and the, the American priest is, waits outside as the homeless man, homeless priest goes in to see the, the Holy Father. He's in there for however long, and he comes out, and the man just, just has this dazed look on his eyes. And they're making their way through the hallway, and he got you, the, the American priest can't just, can't wait to ask them what happened. So finally they get outside, and he says, what happened? And he says, well, um... I went in and John Paul, he looked at me and he said, so your friend told me and he, that you're a priest and that this happened and this happened and this happened. He said, yes. And he said, okay, I would like you to go to confession to me. The Lord in his mercy, he wants to heal you. And he said, okay. So I said, okay. And I, I knelt down and, and I told him everything. I just spilled everything. I said everything from the very beginning, all the sins that have been part of my life until this moment. And he gave me absolution. And, he, and John Paul II said, okay, sit down now. And then John Paul got out of his chair and he knelt down in front of me and he says, now I want you to hear my confession. And he said, the Pope went to confession to me. And I gave him absolution. And when he stood up, he said, okay, I have a job for you. You've been living among the homeless and the addicts of Rome as one of them. I need you to go back and live among the homeless and addicts of Rome as a priest. Because they need the mercy that God can give them through you. Because they need the love of God that he can give to them through you. Because even your brokenness can be used for God's glory. This is the truth for every single one of us. Whether it's David's victory over lions and bears that can lead him to fight Goliath, or it's whether this priest's just absolute degradation and his failure and his shame, or your failure and your shame, or my failure and my shame, God can use it all. And this is the last thing. But what do we have to do? We have to let him into the boat. That's it. Just let him into the boat. Tonight, for some of us, Jesus is saying, can I just get in your boat? Just keep doing what you're doing. I just want to be close to you. And some of us, Jesus is saying tonight, okay, take me with you tomorrow. Take me with you into your conversations with your friends. Do what you know to do, but just do it with me. And for some of us tonight, Jesus is saying, okay, now will you go out with me? Now will you just leave everything and follow me? Because <laughs> Jesus is patient, but he is really pushy. And he doesn't stop until he has all of our hearts. And he won't stop until he has your whole heart. And tonight, in this adoration time, as we magnify the Lord, we recognize that God will use every single part of your past. God will use every wound for his glory. God will use every strength for his praise. And if you let him, if you simply say, you can come into my boat, The plan that God has for your life. In some ways, you'll be able to look back at this night 
and say, I know it started long ago, but on that night in October, that was when I finally realized that God had a plan for my life. And I finally said yes. Jesus, everyone in this room matters. Because everyone in this room matters to you. Our wounds matter to you. Our hurts matter to you. What broke our heart matters to you. Help us to praise you, to adore you, and to see you tonight in the Eucharist. Help us to glorify you and to love you and to magnify you this night and every night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Almighty God, bless you, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. <laughs>